what do you do if there's no family? Yeah. You know, like, to be honest, my family's estranged, sadly, <laughs> dysfunctional, <laughs> for want of a better, but, you know, really sadly. Um, yeah. I've been in hospital and can't put family for next of kin. And, you know, I mean, I can't be a donor now because I've had the cancer, but I know other friends in the same situation, and everything tonight's revolved around the family. I've got the final say, and I think that's quite wrong. Uh, I'd like to know that the doctor would be able to make that yeah. choice for me. Well, I can start with the law, and then we can mm. find how that... Yeah. The, the legislation specifically says that if uh, all best efforts are made to find um, next of kin, and they cannot, then the, um, I guess the, the register would be um, consulted, and in the absence of any evidence from the register or anything else, then uh, the designated officer is the authorised um, decision maker in those situations. Mm. Mm. And practically, I don't think my mic's on, practically we'd uh, discuss with your friends and, and, and other individuals um, mm. who know you to ascertain what your wishes were. <coughs> and that would be our primary objective, is, is to act in what your wishes would have been. So I think that would become clear. If, if, if there was no family full stop anywhere, then the DO can authorise uh, if, no, if there's a lack of objection in South Australia. And I, I can say that this has in fact happened in the past in South Australia. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. The key to the law is all reasonable investigation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, look, those of us who wish to donate our organs are aware that we're sort of engaging in wear and tear on our bodies as the years goes by. And I just thought I might give you, say, three case studies that you might, just to, to give us an idea of how we might be useful or not. <laughs> so I have a 40-year-old son who's pretty healthy, except he has malaria. Um, I am a 63-year-old woman who enjoys a fair few drinks um, <laughs> and gave up smoking 30 years ago. Uh, so, But what about, say, in another um, 15 years? So if we take my son now, or let's give him a bit, but just <laughs> theoretically, and me now and me in another 15 years, what, what, what are you likely to be able to get from us in terms of organs and tissues? Um. <laughs> So that one. Um, yeah. I, I think the specifics of malaria are, are probably out of my realm of expertise, to be honest with you. Um, and we would certainly take advice on that, but a 40-year-old but a male certainly would be able to offer the majority of organs, assuming the malaria is treated and the recipient is informed of the risks of, of transmission. Um, but there are always special cases that, we, that are discussed amongst the expert uh, transplant uh, teams, and, and they come to a conclusion on that. Um, and I can't I was too busy thinking about the malaria one. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was also, there was also the issue of... Uh, I enjoy a drink, and um, As we I all do. Yeah. Yeah. So what organs would we use? Look, <laughs> yeah. in 15 years' yeah. time, um, w there would be a, a general as assessment of your, your blood as the potential recipient. And, but at 63, given that history, uh, y you'd likely be able to donate um, most of the organs. Um, Smoke, uh, the smoking and the lungs is, is a relative contraindication. and uh, I think the guideline is 20 pack years, so it depends when you started and how many you smoked. But practically, it would go on how well your lungs look on x-ray and uh, how well you're oxygenating as the potential donor. What about when she's 78? 15 um, years time. 15 years time. You, 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 the, the, the absolute cutoff isn't 80. Okay, it will be. We will offer, and they will, if there is if there is utility in those organs, then. Um, <laughs> It will be assessed at the time, but as you get older, you're very right to say if you continue the drinking and you stop the smoking, which is excellent, um, you, your organs do naturally degrade with age. And, and past 80, then the, the utility is, is greatly diminished, although uh, the uh, corneas are still useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do, we do have. Yeah. We do Perhaps have age Steve, guidelines. Steve, you could talk through the age sort of guidelines. Mm -hmm. We do have age guidelines. If you, some people are 78, it's. it's uh, the, probably likely that the organs that we would consider are kidneys and liver. And then liver will be looked in, in, at in the light of somebody's drinking history. And um, <coughs> that may or may not preclude them, um, based on a, a whole other range of physiological parameters that you'd look at as well. What about so heart and lungs? Heart and lungs would, uh, it would generally, somebody that age would be uh, too old to donate their heart and lungs. We're looking at uh, 60, 65 years old for those organs as a guideline. Tissues, tissues. I, I tissue. There's uh, there's no no uh, age guidelines for, for those. 
Um, the only, generally the only tissues that we, uh, that we retrieve here in South Australia are heart valves or eyes um, at this point in time. And uh, heart valves, you know, we're looking at the, the upper limit on that of, of 55. But certainly not, there's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, limit with eyes. Yeah, thank, yes. thank you again. Um, no one's talked about switching from an opt-in situation to an opt-out situation. Would that improve take, take up? Presumably it would. Are there philosophical, practical issues against it? Because it seems to me that you're losing about half your potential donors. Um. While you think. No, I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about right. that off the top of my head. Yeah, there has, there's al always discussion about that, as, especially because um, Australians been very uh, laid back, shall we say. We're probably less likely to, to opt out. Um, but it, it's not, opt out, still if you, you can opt out, and people do, and it's not a mandate. Mm -hmm. And um, what's his name from Spain? Martin Zant, Martin Ant, Zant. Yeah. Metazans. Metazans. Uh, I was at a presentation from him. He, he was very um, instrumental in introducing the opt-out in Spain. And uh, externally from Spain, a lot of people said that must have changed everything. And he emphatically denies that it changed a thing. He said what changed was uh, with the shift came a massive education program, somewhat similar to what Donate Life is is. In adopting in this country now and in fact many of the things that are modelled on what took place there because they argue very clearly that the opt-out system superficially but it's a band-aid and it does not change anything in the long run and it's not responsible for the increased levels in Spain. Mm. Internationally, it, it doesn't hold out that it improves organ donor, uh, organ donor numbers. Uh, certainly, countries like Brazil have actually seen a fall off in numbers uh, because society were mistrusting with the legislation. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful around those things, particularly the way Australian society is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that you're presumed to be a donor. Uh, at the moment, we, we opt in. We say, yes, we wish to be a donor. But it, it's that uh, you're presumed to be a donor unless you opt out, you say, no, I am not. Um, but yes, there is some suggestion too that Australians that would actually nudge an awful lot of people into action to say, you can't tell me what to do. Mm. And I think consideration needs to go to the recipient. So why do we do what we do? I mean, ultimately it's so that somebody else can live. So if we're gonna give a suboptimal organ because we're accepting everybody because we're now, you know, everyone's an organ donor unless you say you don't want to be. So I think it's about recipient outcome as well and doing things just because we can do them, we need to do them well. And I think, you know, you lose that perhaps with an opt-in versus opt-out. So I think we give people and you can have a, you know, a genuine discussion and, you know, we can have useful conversations with our family about what we want to do end of life. And it's not just always about organ donation, it's about good end of life care as well. It's interesting to note that South Australia's had a very high organ mm. donation mm. rate, and we've had the opt-in uh, opt-in system, and mm. so it doesn't yeah. seem mm. to yeah. add up. So South Australia mm. has had a rate of around 20 donors per million for a long time, with the legislation as it is. Mm. So it speaks to the fact that changing the legislation isn't going to make mm. a big difference. Mm. I think my question relates uh, to the opt-out idea, but at a different point, in a different way. What happens in the event that you have all of these procedures in place and there's a potential donor on uh, a ventilator machine, the parents, the parents or the, uh, the loved ones have indicated uh, verbally that they will give permission for donation. But in the end, they do see this uh, ventilation as uh, life support mm -hmm. and uh, they say, well, perhaps not yet. Let's, let's wait a while. Uh, how long can you wait? What, how long is that window of opportunity when organs remain viable? And in the event that they opt out and say no, never, you have a, a body that they see as alive on ventilation. Who gives permission for that, that machine to be switched off? Is that me? How lucky was <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think that comes down to the, the communication with the family and clearly if they're struggling to come to terms with the fact that their loved one has died, which isn't uncommon, um, we, we do need to sit down and explain that clearly and, and, and continue to emphasise that and, and probably organ donation then is something that's separate to them understanding the fact of death because that's what they haven't understood, therefore organ donation is blurring that issue. Um, but ultimately, that individual is dead. They, ha they have a death certificate. Um, we would take legal advice in the hospital, but, but ultimately, that patient has died, and there is no legal recourse for extubating them and saying, I'm sorry, they have died. Um, there you go. Um, practically, I've never come across that as, as an intensivist in, in, in my practice. Um, we, we do have people who don't understand the fact of death, but after prolonged discussion, um, it, they come around and um, the ventilator is removed. Time, we'll finish these three questions. Uh, just in regard to the 73% um, of people that uh, approve of organ donation, with such a high percentage, wouldn't it make sense to have uh, an opt out law so the people that want to do it, which it seems to be the majority of us, don't have to jump through hoops and paperwork and have all these meetings extraneous to our wishes to uh, donate organs? And Yes, it is a, 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 a very traumatic time when somebody dies. There's never a right time to be told your mum's dead. Uh, and it does cause extra grief to the family when, they're, you know, when we raise the issue of uh, organ donation. Uh, but uh, st stopping that donation is not possibly the right way to go down, perhaps offering more support to the family uh, at the time. And I know you guys are probably doing as much as you can, but maybe we need to have more money in uh, the support services so we're not losing... Uh, these donors when they come up. Because like I say, 73% of people want it and at a very emotional time that's being taken away from us. Mm. Um, consent rates aren't far off 70%, so I, I think the actual gain from opt out wouldn't be huge if that is the actual number. We don't really know what the actual number is, but, but practically we, we achieve around 70 or 60 to 70. Um, and, and there are, there are perceived dangers with, with an opt-out system um, that, that I guess we talked about earlier and, and it's been a decision at a national level not to pursue that on advice of, of countries like Spain where, where they feel that is not the way to go and there are other ways to improve our donor rates which are achieving good outcomes on the short period of time that we, we've had donate life. But, but with, with smokers, um, we didn't give them a, a choice to, we, we made them have to opt out of uh, restaurants type thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't um, won't wait for the, you know, didn't wait for legislation uh, to uh, move in such a way. We decided what the majority wanted was the best option, and the, the smokers had to comply with that. And so let those who don't want to uh, not smoke in a restaurant, they can, mm. you know, do, do something else. Like those who don't want to uh, give their organs, let them fill out the forms and, and make it difficult, <laughs> difficult for them. Because most of us want to do that, like I say. I think the difference here with smokers, Martin, is that it's a lot more culturally acceptable to, mm. to force people in a restaurant. But that, that's a, it's a cultural thing. Once we start introducing the laws and people will be uncomfortable with the laws, mm. uh, then we can get people used to the culture change, but we've got to start introducing laws that are actually useful. Um, there's a, oddly enough, what I'm about to say comes from uh, the House of Lords in England. It's a lovely statement that was made a good few years ago, um, and it was, describe the law as catching us, catching up with medicine, but in the rear and limping a little. <laughs> and the reason for that was a very clear decision because societal shifts do happen. But we all sit here and look at some other societies in which we have laws that drag and force the population along. And we say, we don't want to live in that kind of society. So the laws in these kind of areas sit very firmly and calmly alongside ethical guidelines. And yes, we do come along in the rear and we limp a little, but I think that's a society that we'd all prefer to live in. And yeah. I think, yeah, good point. And I think um, a majority of our families say no because they don't know the wishes. So in actual fact, you know, taking that choice away what the important thing is, is to actually talk to your family because they will say err er on the side of caution when they don't know. Mm. So you'll find that majority of families will uphold your wishes given that situation. 
So, yeah, so it's interesting just that you need to have that conversation. And 43% of you have not had that conversation because <laughs> you pressed that button on that bar graph, so. <laughs> um, I've got two questions, really. Uh, both my husband and myself have registered as donors. Uh, but we've also signed our bodies over to science mm -hmm. when we do die. Mm -hmm. Which one takes precedent is the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, I'm an asthmatic and I'm on steroids daily. Does that have any effect at all with donor donation or, in fact, research? <coughs> well, um, generally, with, if you donated your, uh, your body to science, that would be, you, that would be exclusive of, uh, of becoming an organ donor, so you can't do both. Um, I think it would be easy for you. So that takes precedent? I think um, donation would take precedent um, yeah. in terms of utility and, and yeah. the benefit that yeah. society could get from your very yeah. kind offer after your death. Um, you would pursue the organ donation over your contribution to science. Okay. Mm. And the medication side of things? Well, like everything, it would be done to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and we discuss that with the relevant uh, transplant clinics. Right. And we have had the conversation with our family, too, so... Good. Well done. <laughs> Just in terms of the whole body um, donation to science, if you died in the ward or died at home, so you didn't die in an intensive care unit, mm without being a potential donor, then your body will go to science if that's what you've wished. Yes. So, that's a very so good point. If, you, <laughs> if you die in an intensive care unit, that's the only time where there would be a discussion around the science or organs. Mm. If you died in the ward or at home mm. or on the street, your body will go to science. <coughs> I, I feel like you've been careful about discussing the recipients versus the donors. And if I recall exactly, there was a young woman in Western Australia, very sadly, recently, who was unable to manage the organ that she received and through her lifestyle destroyed it. So I guess what I'm, you've reassured us that the rich can't buy their way to the top of the list. What do you say to the family who says, will a good person get my child's mm -hmm. organs? Mm -hmm. In other words, are you going to reassure that person that the pedophile stands equal with the saint? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're out Who'd of time. To take that question? <laughs> <laughs> we do um, have a, a transplant coordinator mm, up yeah. in there who yeah. might I'm like happy, to comment. I'm happy to, happy to comment unless anyone else wants. Um, uh, that case in, in Perth was interesting, and she didn't. She went overseas to get an, an organ um, and, and died. Mm. And it was it was very clear from Western Australian point of view that that was the right decision. And I think with intensive care and uh, the donor community, we supported that uh, ethically. Um, um, it's a limited resource, the organs, and, um, and, and they, will be, they, they should be used on a, on a, on a uh, utilitarian um, sort of mandate where the, the most use goes to the best person. But um, in terms of where you draw the line, in terms of a paedophile versus somebody in prison, I, I think there is diverse views on that. And, and um, uh, Do they influence the decision? Um, I'm not on that side of things, so I, I don't... But they would influence my decision if I was, to be fair. I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you very much to our panellists for being here and, and providing expert advice. And thank you to everybody for asking the questions and for your participation. If you want to know uh, more information, the RIOS website will run through all of this again. You'll be able to have a look at it again. Or um, I also recommend the if you'd like to explore this further, the Donate Life website is an absolute um, mine of information. So both of those you can follow up. Thank you very much for coming tonight. <laughs>